Korea has been very effective at bringing into the nuclear sector. One of the things that's most exciting about SMRs is when we start to look at the, the most difficult to abate parts of the economy, the gaps in our plans to decarbonization. And it turns out that some of the SMR designs that are under development um, will be very helpful to us in, in reaching the, the apples at the top of the tree. Hi everyone, uh, this is Taejun David Lee, uh, the professor of the KDI, Korea Development Institute, uh, School of Public Policy and Management, uh, hosting the interview is with an overseas and expert uh, organized by KIA. Uh, so we will begin the part two of the interview with Ms. Diane and Cameron, and the head of the Division of Nuclear Technology Development and Economics at OECD and NEA. Uh, we will continue our discussion on nuclear energy issues around the world. Uh, first question, uh, the South Korea is now uh, reviving uh, the country's nuclear energy uh, ecosystems and hoping to uh, become number one in the country with advanced nuclear power technologies, uh, talents and skills and expertise and even experiences. Uh, what is the uh, prospect of the nuclear export market? Uh, in what area does South Korea have its uh, competitiveness? And what areas should Korea uh, the working to improve? So I think the prospects for nuclear exports uh, are, are significant. I think we're going to see demand for nuclear power to at a minimum double, if not triple by 2050. And that will be through a combination of long-term operations, um, but also large scale new build and probably on the order of $300 billion worth of SMR uh, new builds. Uh, construction projects in a range of different types of countries like we talked about. Um, in existing uh, nuclear power countries, uh, uh, but also embarking uh, nuclear power countries. I think we're, we're seeing interest from um, Southeast Asian countries, we're seeing interest from uh, African countries, um, and interest in South America as well. So Korea has been uh, an important part of the export market. Um, and one of the areas where Korea has an excellent, excellent track record and reputation is around um, uh, the engineering procurement and construction strategies for nuclear new build projects, especially large nuclear um, construction projects. Um, the application of digital uh, innovations, the use of um, uh, technologies like uh, big data, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, these digital innovations have been, um, they are innovations from outside the nuclear sector that Korea has been very effective at bringing into the nuclear sector to increase both safety and economic efficiency and performance of, of the nuclear sector. Talent pipeline so important for young people to see a future for themselves, a future career in this field, or they won't choose to study. I think that we're seeing a lot of young people around the world getting excited about SMRs and excited about being part of the climate change solution. Um, and so that's important for young people to choose to study uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and to choose to, to, to look at nuclear for their careers. And then lastly, and possibly the most, um, maybe the most important, I mean, they're all important, they're all necessary, but public confidence, public trust building, an open, transparent dialogue with the citizenry, um, a fair and just approach to benefit sharing, um, with, with people in the community. I think as Korea turns back towards nuclear, you know, looking at that list of enabling conditions um, beyond just the engineering and technical know-how uh, is going to be critical for success. The next question uh, is about, uh, as we just discussed in the part one, uh, SMR, SMR and getting uh, much attention uh, lately. Uh, the, the why so, the what kind of strength do they have? Uh, the what is your uh, perspective into SMRs? And I think it's also really important because it has the potential to be um, extraordinarily impactful in pathways to decarbonization. I think the first thing that I would say here is that we're, I would just remind people again, we're talking about a range of sizes 
from as small as five megawatts electric to 300 or even more 400 megawatts electric and a range of temperatures. This represents a lot of different applications. And so again, I, I, I think that the easy, there's a lot of different parts to our decarbonization challenge. The first one is to decarbonize our electricity source. Uh, the next challenge is to electrify as many parts of the economy as we can. So we decarbonize the electricity, we electrify the economy. There will still be gaps. There will still be parts of the economy that are extraordinarily difficult to electrify and to decarbonize. And there will be places where um, grid can't reach, wind and solar and hydro, hydro or water power can't reach into. And so when we start looking at where are the gaps, those are the places where some of these SMRs can enter. So for example, um, off-grid mining, resource extraction off-grid. Mining all over the world um, depends on diesel today. Um, what is the alternative to diesel? Um, sometimes electrification is not possible because of the remote location. Uh, to build a transmission line is prohibitively costly. Um, well, SMRs of a certain size, maybe 10 megawatts, could be deployed into those sites um, and replace the diesel. Another example, synthetic fuels. Um, we need hydrogen to produce synthetic fuels like ammonia um, because it is very likely that we're going to need, uh, we're going to need to decarbonize parts of the transportation industry that cannot be electrified or that are not easy to electrify. So for example, marine merchant shipping. So all of those container ships with goods that are crossing the oceans, um, very difficult to electrify those. So we probably need to be able to power them um, with some form of synthetic fuel. And maybe that will be hydrogen fuel cells, maybe, or maybe it will be ammonia or some other synthetic fuel. Today, most hydrogen is produced with, from, fossil, from fossil energy sources. It's not clean energy, hydrogen is not clean energy unless it's produced from non-emitting sources. And so nuclear energy has a potentially really significant role to play in producing hydrogen. Now that could be from large scale nuclear um, uh, power plants in a hub model, or it could be from small modular reactors in a distributed model. Um, where you would do the hydrogen production with an SMR close to the site of consumption. One of the things that's most exciting about SMRs is when we start to look at the, the most difficult to abate parts of the economy, the gaps in our plans to decarbonization. After we've picked all the low hanging fruit, there's still some fruit at the top of the tree that's very hard to pick. And it turns out that some of the SMR designs that are under development um, will be very helpful to us in, in reaching the, the apples at the top of the tree. The, in addition, uh, the SMRs have many uh, advantages and a strengthen, uh, as you mentioned, yes. and compared to large reactors. Uh, however, uh, some argue that it is costly to operate mm -hmm. SMRs uh, than and to operate one large reactor. Uh, for instance, uh, they argue that to replace uh, Shingori and number three, uh, 14 units of SMRs are needed. Uh, how could we solve this issue and uh, what is the outlook uh, about this? And one of the things that, uh, that I try to remind policymakers of is that uh, the question is really not large scale nuclear or SMRs. You actually probably need both in different settings. Um, now, uh, in this particular example, you might consider replacing um, uh, and installing 14 SMRs at one site. At that point, you really should be asking yourself, should I be building a large scale nuclear power plant? And, and what are the, how do the costs of the two uh, scenarios compare? Now, the costs of SMRs, um, they are being demonstrated um, and the deployment is starting. So the first SMRs to be deployed will be deployed at uh, first of kind costs. We call, economists call it first of kind costs. Um, the first time you build something, um, at, your costs are the highest and then you learn. And the next time you build, you do it a little bit better or a little more efficiently and your costs come down learning by doing. The theory is 
that with large scale nuclear, you have economies of scale. And with SMRs, you're going to try to get economies of multiples. It is possible that we will reach a point in the future where we can um, factory produce for 14 SMRs and the costs will be less than one large nuclear power plant. The next question is uh, the disposal of a high level radioactive waste is one of the biggest challenges in the nuclear industry. Uh, has there been a country at a well, it has shown outstanding progresses with regards to managing spent fuels. Is there uh, any case which uh, South Korea could refer to? Uh, how should we communicate with the uh, general public and uh, lay citizens and local residents, uh, as well as angry citizens and, and the industry and with regards to uh, uh, such uh, the issues? The management of waste is usually one of the top questions that the public has. The countries that are uh, demonstrating sort of best in class, an example for the rest of the world, Finland is leading the world. Uh, they have constructed their deep geological repository uh, and they will begin um, uh, its, its operations in the not too distant future. Sweden has also made tremendous progress and Canada has also made tremendous progress. And one of the things that these three countries have in common is the, is the way that they approached the siting process and the public conversation. Um, so it's really important to have community conversations and to have sort of um, uh, open siting processes. So the way that the three countries did it is they actually invited communities to express their interest in being the hosts. You have the human conversation even before you do the geological, scientific, technical work. So there, and, and it's a process that cannot be rushed. Um, building public trust, uh, it, it, it's something that takes time and there's no substitute to taking the time. Um, but once you have built that public trust, so when I, I, I because I'm Canadian, I know more about the Canadian uh, process. So maybe I'll speak a little bit about that one, but we took in Canada, um, a lot of lessons learned from the leaders in Finland and Sweden. And in the Canadian context, we took 10 years um, from the invitation for citing expressions of interest from communities. And we received, I think it was 24 or 26 um, in communities expressed interest in being considered as a possible host. And then there was a 10 year process with site visits and discussion and community town hall meetings and engagement answering questions and communities had the option to uh, step out of the process at, at any point. If they learned something or if they changed their minds, they could step out. Um, and it wasn't until much further in the process um, that the geological analysis started. Um, now, obviously you don't want to spend a lot of time with a community that is not a geologically viable spot, but you also cannot risk being seen to have selected the site and be imposing it on a community that is not willing. And the reason I'm focusing on the human side is because, um, is because technically, this is not an engineering challenge. We have technical and engineering solutions. So it's not a technical problem. We have the technical solutions. Last question. Uh, in the past, the nuclear the industry is used to be managed mainly by governments at the national level. Uh, however, uh, lately, uh, many private companies, especially yes. a conglomerate, are entering the nuclear industry and nuclear development. Uh, what do you think about uh, such a trend? And what is the meaning of such a change? Some of those countries uh, that were, you know, in the first wave of build out uh, with the world leading national laboratories and uh, the first real deployment of civilian nuclear power. Um, when the build-outs happened in uh, 1950s, 60s, 70s, even 1980s, um, most of those countries had vertically integrated um, nuclear sectors that were essentially state-driven. Uh, uh, they were they were government um, uh, they were government-run, um, government-owned, government-run. And since then, um, many of those have, to different extents, privatized or divested. Um, aspects of their nuclear sector and assets to the private sector. So today, when those countries turn again to nuclear and want to build new nuclear, they're building 
maybe even a very similar technology, um, but against a completely different uh, uh, context. Uh, and the, the relationships between the different partners that you need to bring together uh, are characteristically different. They're no longer vertically integrated. They're now horizontally uh, distributed because there are, there are two other nuclear leaders, China and Russia, who have not privatized um, in the same way to the same extent and have not changed their philosophy of vertically integrated implementation. And so now those countries that have chosen to embrace the efficiency um, um, that you can get from the private sector that want to harness the, um, the innovation of the private sector, uh, we have to figure out, those countries have to figure out how to coordinate a project um, where, where you're no longer vertically integrated. Um, and there are, there are, this is one of the questions that we uh, spend a lot of time thinking about at the Nuclear Energy Agency. And we look at different models where there's been success. And the Team Korea model is one of the models where there has been success, um, like at the Baraka project in the UAE. Um, the way that the private sector worked with the state-owned entities, um, it, it, it worked very well. Just to say that it's a profound question and um, it requires very careful consideration. I should have started with the, with the most basic um, point, which is even in countries that have divested and privatized many aspects of the nuclear sector, um, it is a sector that cannot be fully uh, privatized. Governments must maintain a role uh, because it is a controlled sector. Um, so there are um, regulatory responsibilities, there are nuclear nonproliferation safeguards, but also it's critical infrastructure. Uh, governments have a role to play in uh, risk sharing and in financing of critical infrastructure. Uh, it is time uh, to say goodbye. Uh, the, before we say goodbye, so let me give you a moment, uh, the making of remark uh, for us. Um, yeah, for just a huge thank you for the invitation <laughs> to have this conversation today. And um, we're, you know, at the Nuclear Energy Agency, we're following uh, Korea's policy development and progress on nuclear projects with great, great interest. Um, Korea is a very active participant uh, at the Nuclear Energy Agency, um, and, uh, and we look forward to working together um, as you chart your path forward in Korea, uh, deciding what is right for you uh, in Korea. Uh, thank you again uh, for uh, your wonderful uh, knowledge sharing, and I wish you the best of love. And thank you for everyone for watching the interview.